reinterpreting our past, understanding and knowing that we can move from where we are, that we can begin to design the kind of life that empowers us, that gives us happiness, that enable us to be on top of who we are, knowing that as we begin to explore new horizons and new vistas in life, that as we begin to, to focus on developing ourselves, as we begin to elevate ourselves and not to follow the crowd, activating the thinker in us and dis disciplining and putting on hold the emotional part of ourselves. It's not easy, but through practice and practice and practice, practice makes what? Practice makes improvement. You can always better your best. You can always go beyond anything that you have ever done. You never hit a state of perfection. You're always bigger than what you do. And so all you're looking for are new breakthroughs through practice and practice and practice. You'll get better and better and better. And there's still some things that will happen to you that will catch you on the blind side that you did not anticipate. You'll get knocked down, but you won't be knocked out. You'll be able to get to your feet again, be on the ropes, but you have a fast recovery rate when you work on yourself. Read inspirational books, of course. Listen to tapes that begin to inspire you and stay around people who will empower you. So you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind. See, if you don't program your mind, your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal-oriented. That's why we die of broken hearts early. That's why we're running through life to early grades. We're going through life, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that Henry David Thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation. Most of us go through life running scared. Larry D'Angie, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to uh, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking, boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today, I'm going to take a brick of stuff and bust him in the head. <laughs> so he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, same area, there was that dog there. And the dog started barking, he started running, he saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around and the dog got close to him, he realized the dog didn't have any teeth. <laughs> he said he put the brick down and said, get on out my way. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. In my mind, as I think about this idea of getting what you really want, and being able to attract it into your life. What, what, what we have to look at is basically the obstacles that we have conditioned ourselves. And you notice I say that we have conditioned ourselves because I have never believed that we need to be putting the responsibility on someone else. If you're conditioned, it's because you have allowed yourself to become that. And if we, are condition, if we conditioned ourselves to believe certain kinds of things, and one of the things that we kind of believe and hang on to and, and live with is this whole idea that uh, all of the things that happened to me in my past are what are keeping me from doing what I'd like to do today. So we hang on to these things and we fill ourselves with blame. We say, I'm the middle child. I'm the youngest child. I'm the oldest child. You know? I'm an only child. <laughs> Any one of those is a great excuse. You know, if you're the youngest child, you can say, well, you know, I never, how could I be making decisions for myself and be a fully, fully, a fully functioning person today when I always had somebody else telling me what to do my whole life? How could I think for myself? If you're the oldest child, you can simply say to yourself, well, how could I be expected to think for myself? I always had to think for somebody else. I was always doing it for somebody else. And that leaves the middle child, you know, the classic identity crisis. Oh, poor me. My mother didn't even know my name. <laughs> She's always calling me by this one's name or that one's name. So I don't know where I fit in. So that takes care of everybody except the only child. And of course the only child, well, your parents looked at you and said, we won't be doing that again. Huh? <laughs> you have to live with that, I don't. Huh? So everybody with their birth order or with their mother like their sister better or that we had enough or we didn't have enough or we had too much or we lived in the north, we lived in the south, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I've got too much hair, I don't have enough hair. 
it's falling out, it's not falling out, whatever it is, we all have these excuses. And I call all of these things that we hang on to and use to keep ourselves from reaching these higher places in our lives, the wake. I call it the wake. And the wake is, uh, comes from a story that I heard Alan Watts tell one time. And it was a very powerful story. He said, your life is like a boat. And it's heading up the river at, say, 40 knots. And as it's going, you are somehow able to metaphorically stand on the stern, the back of the boat, and look down into the water. Now, there goes your life in this direction, and you're standing here, and you're looking down into the water. And you ask yourself these three questions. The first question, what is the wake? What is it? What is this thing that you see? And the answer, the wake is the trail that is left behind. That's what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. It's the trail that is left behind. I remember going, all the work I put into this, all the hopes my family and I had, all the travel ball, all the, everything we did, all the games, all the great plays, all the errors I made, the fly ball I dropped at Fullerton, you know, all that stuff I was gonna get drafted, then I did, all that stuff, right? The guys I played with, over like a flicker, man. Like a flicker, that crap was over. And we're on that bus ride back, and I remember thinking, man, I should have tried harder. I should have played harder. I should have given this more. The f you know that stuff guys do, man. You're running sprints, there's two dudes who run every sprint full speed, and then there's the dudes who run 80% six of them. You know exactly what I'm talking about, right? He's kind of cool, you know, doesn't matter. I'm not the fastest guy, so no one will know when I don't win the sprints. You know those guys, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? This is a guy who kind of doesn't really catch the ball on his throwing side in the outfield when he's worried, catches it over, he does everything wrong, throws it back. That's the thing that costs the guy getting thrown out at third and you lose by a run, because you just practice like that. The guy in the bullpen is kind of like not really focused, he's just kind of getting loose, right? Instead of just laser focused on everything he's doing all the time. Right? You don't want to leave here. You don't want it to end, whether it ends in the big leagues, it ends in the minor leagues, it ends here, or you never even get on the field this year. Okay, having wondered whether you gave it all you got, because it's gonna transfer into the man you become when you leave here, and most importantly, it's gonna be your identity. When you get tired, when you get fatigued, when you get down, when you're in a slump, it's your habits, rituals, routines, and your standards that carry you through. And if you don't have good habits, you don't have good rituals, you don't have good routines, always in your life you will fall down in bad times, in slumps, and fatigue, and in stress.